metalsmithing. But why I bring up the undergraduate degree, I think is kind of important in, in a way in which I usually frame artist talks is um, what anthropology or my interest in anthropology, I think helped frame a lot of my understanding. And instead of thinking of things as sort of art, I always thought of things in the context of material culture, which to me is a much sort of more expansive way of looking at the meaning of objects and the meaning of stuff, right? That there's kind of a continuum in which all these things kind of fit, um, kind of, you know, within our sort of cultural and social makeup. So that's always in the background, I think, you know. Um, so that's why a lot of the things, you know, if you've, if you've poked around my website or anything, you'll see that a lot of the kinds of work that I do is really kind of grounded in everyday stuff. It's not like, it's not terribly, like the source material itself isn't terribly elevated. I'm not interested in that. I'm sort of interested in re reimagining the everyday thing or the everyday experience. So that's a little bit about the background. And then, and then maybe just the, the additional piece is so, then I went into this sort of weird offshoot of metalsmithing and that I think really in the end, even though I don't do a lot of that work, although there's some highlights of it here and there, it was just sort of a more in-depth study of just kind of material and the history of material just through sort of one sort of specific avenue of it. And I think what it reminded me of was again, sort of that all materials, all things have histories to them and you can't kind of shake them off. And so it's actually more interesting to use them. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the, the background, but, but ultimately the kind of work that I, you know, if I were to like um, contextualize it is, you know, it's really conceptual in its base in that I'm not driven by any particular format or any medium or any material. I'm always driven by the idea and the situation and, um, and, and then sort of make the things work or use the things that need to work in those situations. So that's sort of the background piece. Um, and then I have a kind of, I can show you if you're interested, like how I got into the Saul Witt stuff. Um, so I have a little, I can show you a little about that. Can I share my screen with you? Will that let me? Nope, I have to, I think somebody has to share. I think Melanie, you have to, could you share co-hosting? Hold me? on, let me try. Oh, can you do it? Oh, you can too, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. you should be cool. Okay, cool, let me do this. Sometimes showing, you know, showing is better than saying. So let me go here and then uh, where's my slideshow? Slideshow play from current slide. Okay. The reason why it's important to kind of show this stuff is I know it's, it's not common in your neck of the woods. So I got into, so Solowit, it, it actually is a confluence of a couple things for me. So in the early 2000s, I, I have family out on the West Coast in California and I would go visit them in Southern California. And around that time, I would start to see these various folks um, spinning signs for um, advertising real estate. This is a common occurrence in Southern California because there's a lot of real estate to be sold. And, um, and, and you see it also just wherever there's really intense car culture what is what I've learned. So these are just some sort of image grabs of, of folk sign spinning. So I became intrigued by this and, and just sort of filed it away. So I do a lot of filing away. Um, and, and then maybe about I guess it's now three years ago, going over almost four years ago, I decided I wanted to hire sign spinners. I like re kept returning to the idea, but I didn't know how I wanted to work with sign spinners. And at first I was like, oh, okay, they're just an analog kind of advertising and I wanna figure out how to hire them. And they basically are function as performers in space. But I was like, well, what do you put on those signs? You know? And so I kind of rattled off a bunch of different things to myself. I was like, oh, you could put images, you could put text, you could do any number of things. And then I sort of came back to, um, in the late 60s, Saul Witt, a conceptual artist who you should all probably be a little bit more familiar than the general public is because of Mass Mocha right down the street from you all and the giant Saul Witt collection of drawings that they have there. But in the late 60s, um, he along with some other artists kind of founded or maybe galvanized this idea of conceptual art that basically the idea was, took precedent over the material and the making and he became known for especially sort of this instruction based art making so that you could create a list of instructions and somebody else could execute it. And it really sort of dematerialized the art object itself. But in the late sixties, he wrote this thing, sentences on conceptual art. And so there are 35 of them. This is just a, 
this is just a handwritten list of nine that's at, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I just like it because it's handwritten. But it says things like conceptual artists are mystics rather than rationalists. They leap to conclusions that logic cannot reach. Or um, like you skip ahead a little. Um, form art, formal art is essentially rational. Rational judgments repeat rational judgments. So I kind of like this, this way in which he's kind of going through like setting down sort of the, the language for conceptual art. So then I thought to myself, well, maybe that's, that's the intersection, you know? And part of it also too was that, you know, Solowit, in spite of like all that language, which is incredibly democratic, um, and this idea of, you know, art being made by anybody is an incredibly democratic idea. The, the place where the, a lot of this work exists is really in galleries and museums, kind of more exclusive spaces. So I was interested in that, like who gets to see this stuff, who gets to experience this stuff. And that, that came back to the sign spinners for me, like that if anything is like the most democratic space, it's the street corner, it's out in the public space. And working with sign spinners, in some ways they all, they come from different walks. Like a, a lot of them come from different kind of movement backgrounds. Um, and so they're extraordinarily um, sort of knowledgeable and proficient in a lot of sort of like kind of these different you know, different kinds of movements or art forms or whatnot, but they don't have any sort of conceptual art training. That's not, you know, not necessarily what, how they come to it, nor is it important. But what I was found so super interesting is the, the way in which they took to that language super um, kind of quickly. So this is just an image in, um, of, a, of one of the iterations of the project where I was working with some sign spinners in, um, in Santa Ana, California, and they are picking from among a whole collection of signs um, what signs they're going to spin. This is, so every year, probably except for this year, um, I go to the world, the sign spinning world championship that's held in Las Vegas. And so it's all the top sign spinners from around the country as well as some international ones who spin for like grand prizes of like $5,000 for, and, and bragging rights. So these, and then I started documenting because a lot of this is also, you know, it's a very physical, it's a physical job, it's a physical activity. They define it as a sport. I see it as an art and we kind of have funny kind of play back and forth on that. But it's really writ very much on their hands and you can tell kind of stylistically the kinds of spinners they are based on the, how they're, it's expressed on their hands. So this is just some images of their hands. And, and then I also, um, I was really interested in their interpretations of the project, you know, whether it's the signs, the language itself, or the act of spinning these things, because they look like the stuff that they normally spin, and yet the contents is very different. And so I started making these didactic labels that look like regular museum labels, but then um, I would ask the spinners to provide an interpretation, and that would replace the, the typical curatorial um, uh, sort of expression of the of the project. So in this one, Rufino Marin, who is from, um, I guess he's, the, he's in the Orange County group of sign spinners in Southern California. So I just asked him and, and I just transcribed what they've, I've, they've spoken to me. And so here he writes, I think that, um, I think that means that an artist creates and it finds its own purpose. You don't need a plan from the start like the plan creates by itself. So there you go. I mean, it's basically a perfect expression of this idea of sort of the instruction art sort of self-generating. Um, so they had extremely like sort of succinct ideas about the project without necessarily having this like conceptual art history, which I found really um, great. So I'll show you this short video because there are sign spinners doing their act, which most of you haven't seen. Um, and then a sign spinner actually describing what it means to do this. And again, he does it way better than anybody else I've ever known, um, like to synthesize both what he does and sort of what it means to do it for this project. Oops, so let me try to do this. Okay, should, is it playing? Oh yeah, hold up. Sorry about that, it was taking, okay. There we go. Art is, is an infinite plane of experience. There is room for it to be taken seriously and room for it to be glib and sarcastic and dark and light and cynical and hilarious and engaging and also aloof and uh, when you combine that with sign spinning and the base of sign spinning, which is one-on-one -on -one human interaction, you know, we use the, the tricks to attract attention, but the real thing that happens is that interaction 
playing with that dynamic, like each person's reaction colors how I I would perform and also how they would receive it. You know, and it's like this there there's a lot more exchange of energy and thought than you might be able to see on the surface level. Yeah. But you know, when like if somebody pulls up and I do something, like if they smile in a certain way, then I might do a certain trick. Or if they look skeptical, I'll maybe pull out a more difficult trick because I don't appreciate being second guessed. So uh, combining it with these messages is, I think it's a very appropriate way to suggest these ideas into the world and that you know it's that your perception of the entire thing like you know this whole art fair is subjective and that you know we we bother ourselves by looking for like a general consensus and like understanding what everybody else thought so that they can either be with it like oh everybody said it was good i thought it was good so i'm with that or everybody thought it was good and they're dumb and i'm brilliant and uh when you put sign spinning into that context making making people's opinions of sign spinning matter is a very hilarious thing to do because you know if you see a sign spinner for an apartment complex it doesn't really matter what you think about it like you can enjoy it or not and it doesn't really matter but when you enter the art world those opinions are like that's like like the thing that everybody's after it's all like hmm like you know people like kill themselves to have some art critic look at their thing for 12 seconds and i'm just out here just acting a fool and uh creating uh creating experiences for people that i think will Anyhow, so um, so I can stop sharing this because you've actually done, let's see, doing this part. So so the reason why I show the sign spinning is because it's it's the reason, it's how the Solowitz stuff started like emerging in the work. I had sort of, I'd always been interested in conceptual art. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm interested in about it. I'm interested in the fact that in spite of its all its democracy or it's the the expression of sort of a democratic appeal of who can do it and how how it can be accessed that at least at the time it would had some degree of exclusion and so what does it mean to be a woman what does it mean to be a woman of color doing this kind of stuff um when it may or may not have been quite accessible so i mean i've always been interested in it for that like piece but you know but there is a quality of um the deeper i got into sort of researching Solowit, just the more intrigued I was about just the general, just the expansiveness of his practice and whatnot. Um, and, and I'm a, you know, I've kind of turned into a bit of a fan, just like I'm a huge fan of all the sign spinners. I'm like the non-spinning fangirl of sign spinning. Um, I kind of feel a little bit that way about Solowit too. So, but anyhow, so that's, I mean, so that's kind of this background of, of the sign spinning. And then the project that you all helped realize for me, which I'm incredibly thankful for, really was on the heels, like, so that video I just showed you, I finished that in February of 2020. And like, what, three weeks later, we were in lockdown, right? So I was in LA, um, people were already talking about coronavirus. Um, I had actually flown there with a mask, you know, but it was like really weird. I didn't know exactly what that was all gonna mean. I came back and a few weeks later we were shutting down my university and I had developed all these really like um, intense like kind of creative relationships with all these sign spinners over the last three years and I was seeing all these things like all you know the thing that started off as like I'm going to hire a bunch of spinners to has now turned into this totally expansive project in terms of just like all the different ways in which I was working with them and that they were driving a lot of elements of the project just felt like really just st abruptly stopped right because there was such a social engagement 
that couldn't be realized anymore, um, at least for the time being. And so I was incredibly sad about that. And I, you know, kind of thought, you know, what am I, how, how's that project going to continue? How am I going to keep going with that? What else can I be doing? And at around the same time, I was like collecting, you know, because everybody was in quarantine and nobody wanted to go out and all sorts of things. I was collecting cardboard because we were getting stuff delivered. I was thinking about like this new way in which we were having to arrange ourselves socially, like we couldn't be close to each other. Um, and then I saw what popped up in my head again. I thought of all those instructional drawings and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to turn those into social distancing marks that were at the part at the point in March and April, you weren't seeing them so much in the US, you were seeing them a lot in Asia. Um, and so what would happen if I just sort of basically reimagined all those marks, but imagined them for, you know, kind of turning like again, and public space into kind of an art space, a performance space, and a socially functional space. So that's that's the long way around of how I got to Solwit. <laughs> that's fascinating. I, I I think I did I have other questions I asked I asked ahead of time. I can't remember. I, th I think that was it, right? Was that I think that was it. Yeah, I know. I it was a super long answer, but it's partially just because you know, like the Solowit project or this version of the project was an offshoot of a much bigger project I had been working on. Right. But it, but it, you know, it was really out of this, it was a bit out of mourning. I mean, I'll say it honestly, I was, you know, yeah. like, what am I going to do? And right. what am I going to, you know, this whole project that I was, I've been invested in. And I've now found new ways in which I'm starting to sort of re-engage with it, uh, the sign spinning project, but, and this project is in some ways allowed me to do that. I'm, I really appreciate you showing all of those images of the, sli the, the sign spinners because I, I, I really am curious about all my students here. I had never seen that before. Have any of you seen that before, the, the sign spinning? I'm getting... Yeah, and, yeah, yeah I, I have. have. It's fascinating. That is so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. I'm, it's like, like I said, it's a West Coast phenomenon down through the Southeast and then it goes up there's some iterations of it as basically it goes probably as far north as DC. And then that's it. And then you don't really see it too much. It's not too much in the Midwest, maybe because of weather, even though there's like big driving culture. Although, yeah, no, there's not like you would think maybe Detroit or Chicago, but no. Um, and then in the Northeast, it doesn't exist. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up to my students. Do you have questions for you, me? especially after installing her her work last week or other questions i'll answer anything i'm used to it because i teach also <laughs> <laughs> i want to know what was the experience for you all like installing those like getting that kit and having to do those uh instructions and wh yeah what was it like I mean, this is the first project I probably, I did an iteration of it, the very initial iteration I did like in the beginning of April in Denver. Like I had my, have my cousin owns a janitorial company and there was like the huge, the run on toilet paper and no toilet paper could be found anywhere in the lower 48. And um, because he runs a janitorial company, he gets toilet paper whole, wholesale. So he was doing it, selling it at cost on the sidewalk. And I said, well, let me, why don't I set some squares to for you but it was really kind of creepy because it was really that early on where nobody was outside so it was like you know we we're setting this stuff up and so that's the only time I've actually done the project myself and ever since I've just I realized I kind of liked it as this kit that got sent out like I couldn't move I couldn't travel but it could so yeah I'd, I'd be really curious from y'all what how that experience was Go ahead and unmute yourself then. You know, I can't tell that you want. I'm curious if you guys have seen anybody standing in them too. Uh, the day after we did it, it kind of rained, so they got washed away. <laughs> <laughs> um, installing it was pretty simple though. The instructions are very clear and we had a lot of fun doing it, I think. Okay. That's good. We did it, so I've sent it just so you kind of have a feel, like I sent it to one space in Portland, Maine, so with the ICA there, 
I sent it also to the Wright Museum of Art, which is at Beloit College in Wisconsin, and then you all, and then I just sent it to somebody yesterday at UC Davis. Um, I just learned that the folks at Beloit, um, I think they used a slightly more permanent paint. <laughs> Um, but you know what the reality is like you look at spray paint. I mean, I use this chalk spray, spray paint and what I was telling Erica is I kind of learned like I live in a pretty arid climate in Colorado. And so I still have a sample one that sits outside my studio and it's been there for now two months and we've had hailstorms and rainstorms. But I think there's something about the aridness that changes, you know, um, with the somehow the composition of how well it lasts like it fades, but it's still really present. And even that one I installed in Denver way in the beginning of April. I asked my cousin to check on it because he's down in Denver all the time. And he says it's still there, which is kind of like boggles the mind. Um, but, but, but in Beloit, they get, you know, in Wisconsin, they get weather that's a little closer to the Northeast. So in the end, they, they had the paint that I sent them, but they think they also, they needed extra because they were doing it in multiple locations. And I think they ended up using a regular spray paint. But, you know, it's like the, what the city uses, you know, when they mark the streets and eventually it wears off. So. Anywho. I I had tried to get the, get permission to do it yeah. in perm, in permanent paint. Yeah. Actually, I thought I had gotten permission. Yeah. And then it turned out I didn't hadn't gotten permission. So like we we I had bought spray paint and we were gonna do it in do as it. A per, permanent. Yeah. Paint. And then it was like yeah no you can do it on the grass in permanent yeah. paint but not um not on the sidewalk. So we ended up not doing it a second a second time. Right. But I would love to hear from maybe a couple people talking about what it was like spray spraying it. Maybe there's something a little transgressive about it. You're getting to spray paint the sidewalk. I thought it was um, much faster than um, I was expecting it to be. And that I was like, I, I thought the process itself of like lining it up would take um, much longer than it did. And I was, I was kind of, I don't know, I felt like once you like got into like the measuring everything, it was very, and that was, that was kind of nice. I, I appreciated that about it. Yeah. And I had that same experience too, when I did it that one time I was like, oh, it's going to have to kind of have to make it straight and whatever, but you get the feel for it. So you set it up a couple of times and then you're like, oh yeah, I, can, I got this. Did people ask you what you were doing? Yeah. They get some head nodding and what were the questions like? What are you doing? What, why are you putting these squares down? And would you just say it's an art project? Was that always the that was the answer? Not social distance squares. You could have been putting social distance squares. Make sure everybody's spread out. <laughs> well, it was, I was worried because it was we did it on the very first day of class, and yeah. when you work together to install it, you really are not socially distant. And um, I was concerned that, like, I wasn't really sure how things were going to play out as far as, is that, is it okay to be not socially distant with your mask on doing things together? And it's, it, and it was, it was fine. But it was definitely something that I wasn't sure how anybody would react to all of us working so closely together, right. that it, right, it seemed right. to be okay. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, what's funny, you'll appreciate this. Like, so in Beloit, the the folks who did it there were another printmaking class. So I think it speaks to printmakers, which I think is great. You know, um, that was sort of an unintended consequence of the, the piece. Like I think the printmaking has embraced it um, because it, it, you know, it's an extension of, of sort of like the history of that practice, but it's done again. But the other thing that I always think is really interesting about printmaking is it's super, you know, again, it's one of these really democratic art forms or it can be, right? You can just repeat, repeat, repeat. You can print anything and you can put it anywhere. Um, so I think that there's also that quality that probably connects as well. All right, okay, good. I think, I think we, should, we have to wrap up because we, okay. we have, we have half, our half hour is just about up. Any last comments or questions from all of you here? I'm dying to see pictures. That's the project for me now. It exists in your documentation of it. Well, I will send you, I, as soon as I look at it, I will send you some of the things that we have. Awesome, thank you. And thanks for doing the project. I mean, that's been, that's been really the most, um, I've met so many people as a result of it. It's actually, it's been really phenomenal. I think some of the things that students said were like, this was really fun. We had a really good time today.
Yeah, and you know, to have fun during a pandemic, you're welcome. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. All right. uh, well, I just want to thank uh, both of you, uh, Melanie and Yumi, for um, participating and all of the students as well. Um, I think it's a really nice extension of the project that we had hoped to have here last summer, and hopefully we'll be able to, to continue that. So um, I just appreciate everybody helping us to sustain um, the work and um, this kind of connection with, with the artists that we bring here. So um, yeah, thanks to all of you. Thanks so much. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs> you too. Bye.